egg in the garden, which is the prayer of our Lord in the garden and its mysteries. What his most blessed mother knew of it. <coughs> By the wonderful mysteries which our Savior Jesus had celebrated in the Senegal, the reign which, according to his inscrutable decree, his eternal father had consigned to him, was well established, and the Thursday night of his last supper, having already advanced some hours, he chose to go forth to that dreadful battle of his suffering and death by which the redemption was to be accomplished. The Lord then rose to depart from the hall of the miraculous feast, and also Most Holy Mary left her retreat in order to meet him on the way. At this face-to-face -face meeting, the Prince of Eternity and of the Queen, a sword of sorrow pierced the heart of son and mother, inflicting a pang of grief beyond all human and angelic thought. The sorrowful mother threw herself at the feet of Jesus, adoring him as her true God and Redeemer. The Lord, looking upon her, with a majesty divine at the same time, with the overflowing love of a son, spoke to her only these words. My mother, I shall be with thee in tribulation. Let us accomplish the will of the eternal Father and the salvation of men. The great queen offered herself as a sacrifice with her whole heart and asked his blessing. Having received this, she returned to her retirement, where, by a special favor of the Lord, she was enabled to see all that passed in connection with her divine Son. She was enabled to accompany him and cooperate with him in his activity as far as devolved upon her. The owner of the house who was present at this meeting, moved by a divine impulse, offered his house and all that it contained to the Mistress of Heaven, asking her to make use of all that was his during her stay in Jerusalem. And the queen accepted this, his offer with humble thanks. The thousand angels of her guard in forms visible to her together with some of the pious women of her company remained with the lady. Our Redeemer and Master left the house of the Senegal with all the men who had been present at the celebration of the mysterious supper, and soon many of them dispersed in the different streets in order to attend to their own affairs. Followed by his twelve apostles, the Lord directed his steps toward Mount Olivet, outside and close to the eastern walls of Jerusalem. Judas, alert in his treacherous solicitude for the betrayal of his divine master, conjectured that Jesus intended to pass the night in prayer as was his custom. This appeared to him a most opportune occasion for delivering his master into the hands of his confederates, the scribes and the Pharisees. Having taken this dire resolve, he lagged behind and permitted the master and his apostles to proceed. Unnoticed by the latter, he lost them from view and departed in all haste to his own ruin and destruction. Within him was the turmoil of sudden fear and anxiety, interior witnesses of the wicked deed he was about to commit. Driven on in the stormy hurricane of thoughts raised by his bad conscience, he arrived breathless at the house of the high priest. <coughs> on the way, it happened that Lucifer, perceiving the haste of Judas in procuring the death of Jesus Christ, and as I have related in the chapter of the tenth, fearing that after all Jesus might be the true Messiah, came forward came toward him in the shape of a very wicked man, a friend of Judas, acquainted with the intended betrayal. In this shape, Lucifer could speak to Judas without being recognized. He tried to persuade him that this project of selling his master did at first seem advisable on account of the wicked deeds attributed to Jesus, but that after having more maturely considered the matter, he did not now deem it advisable to deliver him over to the priests and the Pharisees. For Jesus was not so bad as Judas might imagine, nor did he deserve death, and besides he might free himself by some miracles and involve his betray betrayer into great difficulties. 
Thus, Lucifer, seized by a new fear, sought to counteract the suggestions with which he had previously filled the heart of the perfidious disciple against his author. He hoped to confuse his victim, but his new villainy was in vain, for Judas, having voluntarily lost his faith and not being troubled by any such strong suspicions as Lucifer, preferred to take his master's life rather than to encounter the wrath of the Pharisees for permitting him to live unmolested. Filled with this fear and his abominable avarice, he took no account of the counsel of Lucifer, although he had no suspicion of his not being the friend whose shape the devil had assumed. Being stripped of grace, he neither desired nor could be persuaded by anyone to turn back in his malice. The priests, having heard that the author of life was in Jerusalem, had gathered to consult about the promised betrayal. Jesus entered and told them that he had left his master with the other disciples on their way to Mount Olivet, that this seemed to be the most favorable occasion for his arrest, since on this night they had already made sufficient preparation and taken enough precaution to prevent his escaping their hands by his artifices and cunning tricks. The sacrilegious priests were much rejoiced and began to busy themselves to, to procure an armed force for the arrest of the most innocent lamb. In the meanwhile, our divine Lord with the eleven apostles was engaged in the work of our salvation and the salvation of those who were scheming his death. Unheard of and wonderful contest between the deepest malice of man and the unmeasurable goodness and charity of God. If this stupendous struggle between good and evil began with the first man, it certainly reached its highest point in the death of the repairer. For then, good and evil stood face to face and exerted their highest powers. Human malice in taking away the life and honor of the Creator and Redeemer, and His immense charity freely sacrificing both for men. According to our way of reasoning, it was as it were necessary that the most holy soul of Christ, yea, even his divinity, should revert to his blessed mother, in order that he might find some object in creation in which his love should be recompensed, and some excuse for disregarding the dictates of his justice. For in this creature alone could he expect to see his passion and death bring forth full fruit, in her immeasurable holiness did his justice find some compensation for human malice, and in the humility and constant charity of this great lady could be deposited the treasures of his merits, so that afterwards, as the new phoenix from the rekindled ashes, his church might arise from his sacrifice. The consolation which the humanity of Christ drew from the certainty of his blessed mother's holiness gave him strength, and as it were, new courage to conquer the malice of mortals. And he counted himself well recompensed for suffering such atrocious pains by the fact that to mankind belonged also his most beloved mother. All that happened, the great lady observed from her retreat. She perceived the sinister thoughts of the obstinate Judas, how he separated himself from the rest of the apostles, how Lucifer spoke to him in the shape of his acquaintance, and all the rest that passed when he reached the priests and helped him to arrange with much haste the capture of the Lord. The sorrow which then penetrated the chaste heart of the Virgin Mother, the acts of virtue which she elicited at the sight of such wickedness, and what else she then did cannot be properly explained by us. We can only say that in all she acted with the plenitude of wisdom and holiness and with the approbation of the Most Holy Trinity. She pitied Judas and wept over the loss of that perfidious disciple. She sought to make recompense for his malice by adoring, confessing, praising, and loving the Lord, whom he delivered by such fiendish and exulting treachery. She offered herself with eagerness to die in her son's stead if necessary. She prayed for those who were plotting the capture and death of her divine Lamb, for she regarded them as prizes to be estimated according to the infinite value of his precious life blood, for which 
this most prudent lady foresaw they would be bought. Our Savior pursued his way across the torrents of Cedron to Mount Olivet and entered the Garden of Gethsemane. Then he said to all of the apostles, Wait for me and seat yourselves here while I go a short distance from here to pray. Do you also pray in order that you may not enter into temptation? The Divine Master gave them this advice in order that they might be firm in the temptations of which he had spoken to them at the supper, that all of them should be scandalized on account of what they should see him suffer that night, and that Satan would assail them to sift and stir them up by his false suggestions. For the pastor, as prophesied, was to be ill-treated and wounded, and the sheep were to be dispersed. Then the master of life, leaving the band of eight apostles at that place, and taking with him St. Peter, St. John, and St. James, retired to another place, where they could neither be seen nor heard by the rest. Being with the three apostles, he raised his eyes up to the Eternal Father, confessing and praising him, as was his custom, while interiorly he prayed in fulfillment of the prophecy of Zacharias, permitting death to approach the most innocent of men, and commanding the sword of divine justice to be unsheathed over the shepherd and descend upon the God-man with all its deathly force. In this prayer, Christ our Lord offered himself anew to the Eternal Father in satisfaction of his justice for the rescue of the human race, and he gave consent that all the torments of his passion and death be let loose over that part of his human being which was capable of suffering. From that moment, he suspended and restrained whatever consolation or relief would otherwise overflow from the impassable to the passable part of his being, so that in this dereliction his passion and sufferings might reach the highest degree possible. The Eternal Father granted these petitions and approved this total sacrifice of the sacred humanity. This prayer was as it were, the floodgate through which the rivers of his suffering were to find entrance, like the resistless onslaught of the ocean, as was foretold by David. And immediately he began to be sorrowful, and feel the anguish of his soul, and therefore said to the apostles, My soul is sorrowful unto death. As these words and the sorrow of Christ our Lord contain such great mysteries for our instruction, I will say something of what has been shown me, and as far as I can understand concerning them. The Lord permitted this sorrow to reach the highest degree, both naturally and miraculously, possible in his sacred humanity. This sorrow penetrated not only all of the lower faculties of his human life in so far as his natural appetites were concerned, but also all the highest faculties of his body and soul by which he perceived the inscrutable judgments and decrees of the divine justice and the reprobation of so many for whom he was to die. This was indeed by far the greatest source of his sorrow, as we shall see farther on. He did not say that he was sorrowful on account of his death, but unto death, for the sorrow naturally arising from the repugnance to the death he was about to undergo was a minor fear. The sacrifice of his natural life, besides being necessary for our redemption, was also demanded as a return for the joy of having in his human body experienced the glory of the transfiguration. <coughs> On account of the glory then communicated to his sacred body, he held himself bound to subject it to suffering, deeming that a recompense of what he had received. This we see verified also in the three apostles, who were witnesses as well of the glorious as of the sorrowful mystery. This they themselves now understood, being formed thereof by an especial enlightenment. 
Moreover, the immense love of our Savior for us demanded that the full sway be given to this mysterious sorrow. For if he had caused it to stop short of the highest which that sorrow was capable of, his love would not have rested satisfied, nor would it have been so evident that his love was not to be extinguished by the multitude of tribulations. At the same time, he showed thereby his charity toward the apostles who were with him, and were now much disturbed by perceiving that his hour of suffering and death, which he had so often and in so many ways foretold them, was now at hand. This interior disturbance and fear confounded and confused them without their daring to speak of it. Therefore the most loving Savior sought to put them more at rest by manifesting to them his own sorrow unto death. By the sight of his own affliction and anxiety they were to take heart at the fears and anxieties of their own souls. There was still another mystery contained in this sorrow of the Lord, which referred especially to the three apostles, St. Peter, John, and James. For, more than all the rest, they were imbued with an exalted conception of the greatness and divinity of their master, as far as the excellence of his doctrine, the holiness of his works, and the power of his miracles were concerned. They realized more completely and wondered more deeply at his dominion over all creation. In order that they might be confirmed in their belief of his being a man capable of suffering, it was befitting that they should know as eyewitnesses his truly human sorrow and affliction. By the testimony of these three apostles who were distinguished by such favors, the Holy Church was afterwards to be well fortified against the errors which the devil would try to spread against the belief in the humanity of Christ our Savior. Thus, would the rest of the faithful have the consolation of this firmly established belief in their own affliction and sorrow. Interiorly enlightened by this truth, the three apostles were exhorted by the author of life by the words, Wait for me, watch, and pray with me. He wished to inculcate the practice of all that he had taught them and to make them constant in their belief. He thereby reminded them of the danger of backsliding, of the duty of watchfulness and prayer in order to recognize and resist the enemy, remaining always firm in the hope of seeing his name exalted after the ignominy of his passion. With this exhortation, the Lord separated himself a short distance from the three apostles. He threw himself with his divine face upon the ground and prayed to the Eternal Father, Father, if it be possible, let this chalice pass from me. This prayer Christ our Lord uttered, though he had come down from heaven with the express purpose of really suffering and dying for men, though he had counted as not the shame of his passion, had willingly embraced it and rejected all human consolation, though he was hastening with most ardent love into the jaws of death to affront sorrows and afflictions, Though he had set such a high price upon men that he determined to redeem them at the shedding of his lifeblood. Since by virtue of his divine and human wisdom and his inextinguishable love, he had shown himself so superior to the natural fear of death that it seems this petition did not arise from any motive solely coming from himself. That this was so in fact was made known to me in the light which was vouchsafed me concerning the mysteries contained in this prayer of the Savior. In order to explain what I mean, I must state that on this occasion Jesus treated with the Eternal Father about an affair which was by far the most important of all, namely in how far the redemption gained by his passion and death should affect the hidden predestination of the saints. In this prayer, Christ offered on his part to the Eternal Father his torments, his precious blood, and his death for all men as an abundant price for all the mortals and for each one of the human born till that time, and yet to be born to the end of the world. And on the part of mankind, he presented the infidelity, ingratitude, and contempt with which sinful man was to respond to his frightful passion and death. He presented also the loss which he was to sustain from those who would not profit by his 
clemency and condemn themselves to eternal woe. Though to die for his friends and for the predestined was pleasing to him, and longingly desired by our Savior, yet to die for the reprobate was indeed bitter and painful, for with regard to them the impelling motive for accepting the pains of death was wanting. This sorrow was what the Lord called a chalice, for the Hebrews were accustomed to use this word for signifying anything that implied great labor and pain. The Savior himself had already used this word on another occasion when in speaking to the sons of Zebedee, he asked them whether they could drink the chalice which the Son of Man was to drink. This chalice then was so bitter for Christ our Lord because he knew that his drinking it would not only be without fruit for the reprobate, but it would be a scandal to them and redound to their greater chastisement and pain on account of their despising it. I understood, therefore, that in this prayer Christ besought his Father to let this chalice of dying for the reprobate pass from him. Since now his death was not to be evaded, he asked that none, if possible, should be lost. He pleaded that as his redemption would be superabundant for all, that therefore it should be applied to all in such a way as to make all, if possible, profit by it in an efficacious manner. And if this was not possible, he would resign himself to the will of his eternal Father. Our Savior repeated this prayer three times at different intervals, pleading the longer in his agony in view of the importance and immensity of the object in question. According to our way of understanding, there was a contention or altercation between the most sacred humanity and the divinity of Christ. For this humanity, in its intense love for men who were of his own nature, desired that all should attain eternal salvation through his passion. While his divinity, in its secret and high judgments, had fixed the number of the predestined, and in its divine equity could not concede its blessings to those who so much despised them, and who, of their own free will, made themselves unworthy of eternal life by repelling the kind intentions of him who procured and offered it to them. From this conflict arose the agony of Christ, in which he prayed so long, and in which he appealed so earnestly to the power and majesty of his omnipotent and eternal Father. The agony of Christ our Savior grew in proportion to the greatness of his charity and the certainty of his knowledge that men would persist in neglecting to profit by his passion and death. His agony increased to such an extent that great drops of bloody sweat were pressed from him, which flowed to the very earth. Although this prayer was uttered subject to a condition and failed in regard to the reprobate who fell under this condition, yet he gained thereby a greater abundance and secured a greater frequency of favors for mortals, though through it, the blessings were multiplied for those who placed no obstacles. The fruits of the redemption were applied to the saints and to the just more abundantly, and many gifts and graces of which the reprobates made themselves unworthy were diverted to the elect. The human will of Christ, conforming itself to that of the divinity, then accepted suffering for each respectively, for the reprobate as sufficient to procure them the necessary help if they would make use of its merits, and for the predestined as an efficacious means of which they would avail themselves to secure their salvation by cooperating with grace. Thus was set in order, and as it were realized, the salvation of the mystical body of his holy church, of which Christ the Lord was the creator and head. As a ratification of this divine decree, while yet our master was in his agony, 
the Eternal Father, for the third time, sent the Archangel Michael to the earth in order to comfort him by a sensible message and confirmation of what he already knew by the infused science of his most holy soul. For the angel could not tell our Lord anything he did not know, nor could he produce any additional effect on his interior consciousness for this purpose. But as I related above, Christ had suspended the consolation which he could have derived from his human nature, from this knowledge and love, leaving it to its full capacity for suffering, as he afterwards also expressed himself on the cross. In lieu of this alleviation and comfort, which he had denied himself, he was recompensed to a certain extent, as far as his human senses were concerned, by this embassy of the archangel. He received an experimental knowledge of what he had before known by interior consciousness, for the actual experience is something super added and new, and is calculated to move the sensible and bodily faculties. Saint Michael, in the name of the Eternal Father, intimated and represented to him in audible words what he already knew, that it was not possible for those to be saved who were unwilling that the complacence of the Eternal Father in the number of the just, although smaller than the number of the reprobate, was great, and that among the former was his Most Holy Mother, a worthy fruit of his redemption, that his redemption would also bear its fruits in the patriarchs, prophets, apostles, martyrs, virgins, and confessors, who should signalize themselves in his love and perform admirable works for the exaltation of the name of the Most High. Among these, the angel moreover mentions some of the founders of religious orders and the deeds of each one. Many other great and hidden sacraments were touched upon by the archangel, which it is not necessary to mention here, nor have I any command to do so. And therefore, what I have already said will suffice for continuing the thread of this history. During the intervals of Christ's prayer, the evangelists say, he returned to visit the apostles and exhort them to watch and pray lest they enter into temptation. This the most vigilant pastor did in order to show the dignitaries of his church what care and supervision they were to exercise over their flocks. For if Christ, on account of his solicitude for them, interrupted his prayer which was so important, it was in order to teach them how they must postpone other enterprises and interests to the salvation of their subjects. In order to understand the need of the apostles, I must mention that the infernal dragon, after having been routed from the cenacle and forced into the infernal caverns, was permitted by the Savior again to come forth, in order that he might by his malicious attempts help to fulfill the decrees of the Lord. At one fell swoop, many of these demons rushed to meet Judas, and in the manner already described, to hinder him, if possible, from consummating the treacherous bargain. As they could not dissuade him, they turned their attention to the other apostles, suspecting that they had received some great favor at the hands of the Lord in the cenacle. What this favor was, Lucifer sought to find out in order to counteract it. Our Savior saw this cruelty and wrath of the Prince of Darkness and his ministers. Therefore, as a most loving father and vigilant superior, he hastened to the assistance of his children and newly acquired subject, his apostles. He roused them and exhorted them to watch and pray against their enemies in order that they might not enter unawares and unprovided into the threatening temptation. He returned, therefore, to the three apostles, who, having been more favored, also had more reasons for watchfulness and imitation of their master, but he found them asleep, for they had allowed themselves to be overcome by insidious disgust and sorrow, and in it had been seized by such a remissness and lukewarmness that they fell asleep. Before speaking to them or waking them, the Lord looked at them for a moment and wept over them. For he saw them oppressed and buried in this deathly shade by their own sloth and negligence. He spoke to Peter and said to him, Simon, sleepest thou? 
couldst not thou watch one hour? And immediately he gave them and the others the answer, Watch ye and pray that you not enter into temptation. For my enemies and your enemies sleep not as you do. That he reprehended Peter especially was not only because he was placed as head of the rest, and not only because he had most loudly protested that he would den not deny him and was ready to die for him, though all the others should be scandalized in him and leave him, but also because Peter, having from his whole heart made freely these protests, deserved to be corrected and admonished before all the rest. For no doubt the Lord chastises those whom he loves and is always pleased by our good resolutions, even when we afterwards fall short in their execution, as happened with the most fervent of all the apostles, St. Peter. When the Lord came the third time and woke up all the twelve, Judas was already approaching in order to deliver him into the hands of his enemies, as I shall relate in the next chapter. Let us now return to the cenacle, where the Queen of Heaven had retired with the holy women of her company. From her retreat, by the divine enlightenment, she saw most clearly all the mysteries and doings of her most holy Son in the garden. At the moment when the Savior separated himself with the three apostles, Peter, John, and James, the heavenly Queen separated herself from the other women and went into another room. Upon leaving them, she exhorted them to pray and watch, lest they enter into temptation. But she took with her the three Marys, treating Mary Magdalene as the superior of the rest. Secluding herself with these three as her more intimate companions, she begged the Eternal Father to, to suspend in her all human alleviation and comfort, both in the sensitive and in the spiritual part of her being, so that nothing might hinder her from suffering to the highest degree in union with her divine Son. She prayed that she might be permitted to feel and participate in her virginal body all the pains of the wounds and tortures about to be undergone by Jesus. This petition was granted by the Blessed Trinity, and the mother, in consequence, suffered all the torments of her Most Holy Son in exact duplication, as I shall relate later, although they were such that if the right hand of the Almighty had not preserved her, they would have caused her death many times over. Yet, on the other hand, these sufferings inflicted by God himself were like a pledge and a new lease of life. For in her most ardent love, she would have considered it incomparably more painful to see her divine son suffer and die without being allowed to share in his torments. The three Marys were instructed by the queen to accompany and assist her in her affliction, and for this purpose they were endowed with greater light and grace than the other women. <clears throat> in retiring with them, the most pure mother began to feel unwanted sorrow and anguish, and she said to them, My soul is sorrowful because my son, my beloved son, is about to suffer and die, and it is not permitted me to suffer and die of his torments. Pray, my friends, in order that you may not be overcome by temptation. Having said this, she went apart a short distance from them, and following the Lord in his supplications, she, as far as was possible to her, and as far as she knew it to be conformable to the human will of her son, continued her prayers and petitions, feeling the same agony as that of the Savior in the garden. She also returned at the same intervals to her companions to exhort them, because she knew of the wrath of the demon against them. She wept at the perdition of the foreknown, for she was highly enlightened in the mysteries of eternal predestination and reprobation. In order to imitate and cooperate in all things with the Redeemer of the world, the Great Lady also suffered a bloody sweat, similar to that of Jesus in the garden. And by divine intervention, she was visited by the Archangel St. Gabriel, as Christ her Son was visited by the Archangel Michael. 
The holy prince expounded to her the will of the Most High in the same manner as St. Michael had expounded it to Christ the Lord. In both of them the prayer offered and the cause of sorrow was the same, and therefore they were also proportionally alike to one another in their actions and in their knowledge. I was made to understand that the most prudent lady was provided with some cloths for what was to happen in the passion of her most beloved son, and on this occasion she sent some of her angels with a towel to the garden in which her son was then perspiring blood, in order to wipe off and dry his venerable countenance. The Lord, for love of his mother, and for her greater merit, permitted these ministers of the Most High to fulfill her pious and tender wishes. When the moment for the capture of our Savior had arrived, it was announced to the three Marys by the sorrowful mother. All three bewailed this indignity with most bitter tears, especially Mary Magdalene, who signalized herself in tenderest love and piety for her master. Instruction which Mary, the Queen of Heaven, gave me. My daughter, all that thou hast understood and written in this chapter will serve as a most potent incentive to thee and to all the mortals who will consider it carefully. Estimate then and weigh within thy soul how important is the eternal predestination or reprobation of the souls, since my most holy Son looked upon it with such great anxiety that the difficulty or impossibility of saving all men added much immense bitterness to the death which he was about to suffer for all. By this conflict, he manifests to us the importance and gravity of the matter under consideration. He prolonged his supplications and prayers to his eternal Father, and his love for men caused his most precious blood to ooze forth from his body on perceiving that the malice of men would make them unworthy of participation in the benefits of his death. The Lord my Son has indeed justified his cause in thus having lavished his love and his merits without measure for the purchase of man's salvation. And likewise, the Eternal Father has justified Himself in presenting to the world such a remedy and, and in having made it possible for each one freely to reach out for such widely different lots as death and life, fire and water. But what pretense or excuse will man advance for having forgotten their own eternal salvation when my divine son and I have desired and sought to procure it for them with such sacrifices and untiring watchfulness. None of the mortals will have any excuse for their foolish negligence and much less will the children of the Holy Church have an excuse since they have received the faith of these admirable sacraments and yet show in their lives little difference from that of infidels and pagans. Do you not think, my daughter, that it is written in vain? Many are called, but few are chosen. Fear this sentence and renew in thy heart the care and zeal for thy salvation, conformable to the sense of obligation arising from the knowledge of such high mysteries. Even if it were not a question of eternal salvation for thee, thou shouldst correspond to the loving kindness with which I manifest to thee such great and divine secrets, that I call thee my daughter and a spouse of my Lord, should cause thee to pay no attention to any visible thing, and embrace only love and suffering for his sake. This I have shown thee by my example, since I applied all my faculties continually to these two things with the highest perfection. In order that thou mayest attain this, I wish that thy prayer be without intermission, and thou, and that thou would watch one hour with me, that is, during the whole of thy life, for compared with eternity, life is less than one hour, yea, less than one moment. With such sentiments, I wish that thou follow up the mysteries of the passion, writing them, feeling them, and imprinting them upon thy heart.